Well, I'm here talking with uh, Nat Sambi about the uh, current state of relations between Indonesia and Australia following the espionage allegations which have been running hot in the press over the last few weeks. It's been a difficult time in the relationship, Nat, and uh, I should say congratulations for the article which you had uh, published in The Guardian very recently. How do you see the, uh, the, the situation currently in the bilateral relationship? Um, yes, thanks. Um, well, I think we're waiting to see really what happens now that Prime Minister Abbott sent his letter up to Indonesia. Um, it is a serious incident that I think we should take note, but just placing it in a broader context, it's one of many uh, in a relationship that experiences ups and downs. Um, and so this latest fluctuation needs to be seen as part of a broader history between our two countries. Um, the way I see it, I think that it might be a good time for both sides to sit down and say, look, um, there's been a rupture in diplomatic relations. There's obviously a little bit of uncertainty about the level of trust between our two countries. And so perhaps it's time for us to sit down and have a really frank and honest conversation um, about the meaning of our relationship and where we really want it to head in future. Um, as I talk about in the Guardian piece, uh, perhaps even intelligence itself might be another area that we could explore in terms of cooperation to, in order to help build that trust. Yeah, for people that have uh, wanted to see closer bilateral relations between Australia and Indonesia, it's, it's in some respects been mm. um, a frustrating relationship, hasn't it? Because almost every decade there seems to be one issue or another that comes up, which brings us to the point that we're currently at now, where the two capitals really aren't talking to each other very effectively. Yes, yes. Actually, there has been histories of up and downs, and there's obviously been ambassadors that have been uh, recalled in the past as well. Um, actually, Peter, I'd actually like to ask you about your experiences, having worked in a number of roles with Indonesia. Um, what do you make of, of what's going on at the moment? Well, in a sense, what I see, Nat, is that um, there's, there's a pattern at play which we do see repeat itself every 10 or 15 years or so in the relationship. Um, and in my own experience as a defence official, I've, I've been subject to similar fluctuations in the past. Um, I remember as a, a relatively uh, uh, freshly minted branch head in, in the late 1990s in defence, working on at the time what was seen to be uh, an initiative to significantly bring the two militaries closer together. This was something called the CDF Pangab Forum which took place in 1998 and was actually a meeting of the, uh, the, the senior military commands of the two organisations. Uh, at the time this was seen to be a major step forward in the defence relationship between the two, two countries. Uh, and of course, um, all of that was, was simply put on ice a um, little less than a year after the, the CDF Pangup Forum took place because of the um, uh, crisis in East Timor and, and the intervention of um, Australian forces as part of the, uh, the Interfet operation to stabilise Timor uh, after their uh, August 1999 uh, referendum. Uh, and so in the space of a little less than a year, you know, what we saw was that our relationship had gone from, you know, the highs of our military commanders getting together to talk with each other through to um, a point where really uh, relations were, diplomatic relations were put on hold for a couple of years uh, as a result of Indonesia's annoyance at the, uh, at the East Timor situation. Now, you know, here we are a um, little more than a decade later and we've seen almost a, a similar type of thing happen between uh, Prime Minister Abbott um, uh, visiting Jakarta as his first overseas visit as, as Prime Minister, saying that no country was more important to Australia's interests than Indonesia. Uh, and then, you know, sadly, just a few, a few months later, um, where, as a result of the espionage allegations, back at a point mm. where, uh, to all intents and purposes, uh, you know, diplomatic contact has been uh, severely curtailed. And I think that's one of the risks for this relationship, is that we just find ourselves going through these sorts of up and down cycles. Uh, and when we're in a down cycle, it's not helped by the fact that media in both countries is almost inspiring each other to get to, you know, higher and higher points of unhappiness and outrage, flags being burnt in front of the Australian Embassy in Jakarta. So somehow what we need to do, I think, is find ways to uh, 
uh, sort of take the heat out of these incidents when they do arise, and, mm -hmm. and they'll continue to arise. And what do you suggest in that regard? Well, look, I think um, you know one of the problems we've got in the bilateral relationship is that it's way too dependent on political ties between the political leaderships of Jakarta uh, and of Canberra. Uh, and what that says to me is that um, relations need to be deepened and strengthened in non-political areas, um, actually in Australian investment and business activity in Indonesia, which is uh, actually surprisingly limited given the proximity of the two countries. We, we have uh, by far a, a larger economic relationship with Malaysia, for example, um, and in people-to-people -people links, uh, because, you know, although Australian tourists go to Bali, they're not really, I think, uh, experiencing you know, the broader nature of Indonesian society. And it's too easy for uh, people that don't have that type of contact with each other to, uh, to just misunderstand the, the sort of the priorities and interests that, uh, that each country has. Now, that's not a quick solution. No, what, what it really means is that we need to look to, I, I think, a five or a 10 year process of very consciously trying to deepen our connections sure. and not just leaving these things subject to uh, you know, the political fluctuations of day-to-day -day politics in Canberra or, or in Jakarta. Right. Well, Nat, I think one of the uh, things that's been new and very interesting in terms of the current crisis in the bilateral relationship has been uh, the much greater use of uh, social media, including from uh, President S.B.Y. himself, who has been using Twitter to express his views uh, during uh, the early stages of the crisis. How, how do you think um, social media has played out and you know, what lessons can we take from this in terms of the bilateral relationship? Yeah, well obviously social media has, um, has a special place in Indonesia. It's very popular over there and Jakarta is the second largest city of Twitter users in the world. Hmm. So it's no surprise that President Udiono um, has uh, discovered social media and has explored it. Not only does he have a Twitter account, he has a Facebook account. Uh, Ibuani, the First Lady, is very popular on Instagram as well. So social media is a means uh, for some political leaders in Indonesia to really communicate with the masses. Uh, President Yudhoyono has used it in the past to tweet personal photos of him and his family uh, and also to, pre uh, to tweet personal messages. And, and what he's really seeking to do in that regard is to present himself as a far more human, um, far more sort of down-to-earth person, which can be sometimes a problem with the political elite in Indonesia. But they're often criticised for being, uh, you know, a little bit above and separate from uh, the, the population. In this regard, SBY, you know, tweeted first Indonesian, mm -hmm. and he tweeted, you know, he, he made his announcements by his Twitter account. So what he's doing there is he's positioning himself um, as speaking directly to you know, the Indonesian people and making clear to them that he's acting on behalf of, of the, on their behalf. So uh, we'll, we'll probably see a lot more of that kind of messaging in future, but that's a sign that SBY is, is trying to garner popular support. Um, he's not running in next year's election. So when you look at it in that sense, it's really about, uh, about asserting himself as a much stronger president compared to how he's been viewed in the past and perhaps even looking towards uh, his legacy as well. That's interesting. And how about in, in the, the, the wider Indonesian society, um, I mean, if Jakarta is the second most, um, I don't even know the right term, Twitter-connected town, uh, I mean, what, what are you picking up in terms of the broader ebb and flow of comment sure. about this uh, situation? Um, Twitter is obviously a site where people uh, can get very emotional, and there's been a lot of heated tweets about Australia um, with the hashtag uh, Gayang Australia, which means crush Australia, which was a term used during confrontasi with Malaysia. Mm. Um, so that kind of sentiment could get carried away. But Twitter and other forms of social media can also be a means of actually uh, quelling this kind of, of high emotion. Uh, one example I wanted to use was uh, my colleagues from the Conference of Australia Indonesia Youth, we've used a, a tool called WhatsApp in order to discuss this particular issue with one, each, with one another, to share ideas, to share information, and to reach a common understanding about you know, how we feel about this, where, how serious this is, whether or not it actually causes a rift at this sort of grassroots level. So there are means uh, for Twitter to be used for ill, to spread negative perceptions about Australia and about Indonesia, but there are other ways in which you can actually use it to build better ties as well. 
Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I guess uh, if, uh, if it can be used in some way to get uh, the young people of both countries actually talking to each other, that, yes. that's a tremendous use. Yes. But w what's the balance between um, sort of heating the situation up or, or creating uh, opportunities for engagement? Where, where do you think the social media sort of sits at the moment on, on, those, on that scale? I think the efficacy of social media in this regard really depends on how well it can be harnessed by those who want to use it for good. So right now it's really easy for Twitter to be carried away with negative ideas and um, with a lot of sense of snarkiness as they call it. Um, so if you have others that are actually really focused on promoting good perceptions, um, Twitter will be, will be effective if they really harness that. So uh, one of the recommendations that our colleague Dave McRae over at Lowy Institute made in his blog post last week is he said perhaps it might be an idea for the Prime Minister for himself to open up a Twitter account and to actually start creating positive perceptions about our country and use that as a tool of positive messaging as well. So I think something that's going to be uh, much more prominent both in Australian diplomacy and in Indonesian diplomacy yes. over the next few years will be use of these sorts of uh, social media accounts. Yes. And I guess uh, we can all aspire ourselves to have Twitter followers in the realm of uh, four and a half million, which I think is what uh, SBY uh, currently has on, on his account. Yes, yes that's right. Well, I guess we'll continue to follow this issue pretty closely, uh, Nat. Um, yes. I think the both of us are looking forward to seeing if we can think of ways to uh, find how to get Australia and Indonesia back onto uh, a closer diplomatic footing. I think people in both countries really see that we have an interest to do that. And let's hope this uh, can somehow be managed to calm the situation down over the next few months. Yes, absolutely. Let's hope it's a turning point for the better. Yeah. Thanks, Nat. Thanks, Peter.